Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Veselina, uh, Mr. Ognian, uh, Zwate. Thank you so much for your words and, and uh, for having me in this part of the world and welcoming me in this part of, my, of, of the world. Uh, I guess my only regret is that I don't have longer to spend here in your beautiful part of the world and, and to see more of it. Um, I, I come from Africa. I've spent most of my career working in Africa. So I have a a, a, an understanding of working in developing economies and small middle income economies. So uh, I think the challenges that you are facing uh, are very well known and relevant uh, to me, but I uh, would love to learn and look forward to learning more about your, your beautiful part of the world. But my, my task today is to set a bit of a, a global scene and then to drill down to hopefully some practical way forward, uh, ways forward uh, which set the scene uh, for your discussions through the day. So I'm going to start off with a, a relatively high-level uh, introduction uh, to set the scene for our discussions. And broadly, if you think about humanity and our uh, stay on this planet, the last 10,000 years has been a relatively peaceful and stable part uh, uh, stay on, 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 the, on the surface of the, of the planet. Um, we've had relatively stable conditions at a planetary level from a climate uh, perspective and from a, uh, a, a perspective of the ecosystems. And in the last 50 years, humans' impacts on the planet have radically reshaped that. And we've moved into a time where the future looks very volatile and very risky for humanity. And basically, we have another 50 years to be able to sort this out. So it's uh, you know, 10,000 years of relative stability uh, on the planet, 50 years of radically increasing our impacts on that planet, and 50 years to sort it out and then hopefully move into a period of stability again. So that's uh, the perspective that we live in. It's a very critical time in terms of the, the future of our planet and a very unique time. So if we think of our, our world in, um, in 2050, I'm just trying to get this going, there we go. Uh, uh, that's, that's right. Uh, perhaps you can just hit it on there. Uh, if you could just hit it on the, the uh, animations through the slides along, thank you. Oh, there we go, is it working? Help me along there. Um, so we think about uh, up to 2050 um, and the challenges that we face as humanity. Uh, we have three basic challenges that we're facing. Firstly, we need to stabilize our climate, uh, and we all know the challenges related to that. The second thing that humanity needs to do uh, is to be able to stabilize our population and the inequities that uh, occur within that population. So the amount of people, the amount of consumption and inequities that uh, occur within our population. And the third thing is we need to uh, that we need to do is to stabilize our uh, biosphere. And this is the living component of the planet. And this is the ecosystems that we are seeing declining and degrading around us. And... Uh, if we firstly think about stabilizing the climate, we have seen a, 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 a level of political commitment around this that seems to be creating uh, almost unstoppable momentum and transition towards a new future for the planet. You know, is this occurring at the speed we want to? Probably not. And do we need a greater sense of urgency to make it happen? Absolutely. But there certainly does seem to be a a momentum and a transition, a political momentum that's happening. And despite some of the, uh, the um, announcements we've heard from the Trump administration uh, in the US, it seems that that purely on the economics of this, and if we look at the uh, graph on your left-hand side, they're purely on the economics of it and the, the reducing prices of renewable energies. We're likely to look at about a 40% uh, uh, renewable energy future by 2040. So this transition is happening uh, purely on the economics of the situation. 
If we look at the second one, um, uh, stabilizing our population and inequities. Again, huge political momentum through the sustainable development agenda and the sustainable development goals. And it looks that it is possible that we will be able to uh, come quite close to eradicating extreme poverty on, on the earth uh, by 2050. So it looks like this may be possible. Again, large momentum around this. Uh, in terms of stabilizing the population numbers on, on the earth, looks like we will be stabilizing between 2050 and 2100. The number of where it stabilizes could be anything between 9.5 uh, billion through to 12 billion people. And that makes a huge difference where it does stabilize. And uh, let me just take a, a moment here to say that when we talk about stabilizing population, we're not talking about draconian measures in terms of uh, population management. But population stabilization is very closely linked to sustainable development and social well-being. So one of the best indicators of population stabilization or reduced fertility is the number of girls that are enrolled in secondary schools. So when you invest in education, particularly in girls' education, you start stabilizing the population. So population very closely linked uh, to sustainable development. But when we look at the third challenge, the biosphere, this is the one that we are very concerned about because the political momentum around this is not what it should be. We are not seeing the same level of political momentum in terms of stabilizing the degradation and the decline in, uh, in, in our biosphere. We continue to see what is more or less a direct uh, uh, trend of uh, a decline in, in, in our biosphere with very little indication that this uh, curve is bending at all. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, if we just uh, step through this. A business as usual um, scenario shows that we have lost about 58% of uh, our population. This is using the Living Planet Index. This is an index that WWF works on. It measures the population sizes of about 14,000 uh, vertebrate populations. And it shows to us that we've lost it at the moment about 58% of those populations. Under a business as usual scenario, we're likely to look at losing two thirds of those populations by 2020. If the scenario continues at, at this rate, we're likely to get into very, very dangerous territory by 2030. So we do not have a choice but to be able to bend that curve and to start looking at how do we start peaking in terms of that decline, making it plateau and starting to restore. So the same thinking that went into the uh, thinking about dealing with climate, how do you peak the uh, carbon emissions, how do you start plateauing, how do you start declining that, uh, that, uh, uh, the carbon emissions curve, the same thinking needs to go into, uh, into the bio biodiversity and the biosphere. And what are those wedges, what are those things that we need to do that are going to bend the curve. And I think this is really where we need to sharpen our thinking, we need to raise the profile, we need a far more targeted approach in terms of stabilizing uh, our biosphere over the next uh, decade. This has to happen within the next decade. If we do not do this, we will be uh, in very dangerous territory. And all the good that work that we've done on climate change will also come to naught because you need those three things, those three big challenges I spoke of, stabilizing our population and inequities, stabilizing our climate and stabilizing our, 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 stabilizing our biosphere. We need all three of those if we want to have a stable future for humanity uh, going forward. And so what are the main threats that are driving that decline in uh, biodiversity and decline in our, in our biosphere? And these are uh, some analyses, again, from the Living Planet report that WWF, report, uh, WWF uh, produces. And you'll see the biggest one of these is habitat destruction. So the way that we modify and change the habitats and the ecosystems is the biggest driver of that decline. An increasing driver in the future, it doesn't come out so strongly at the moment because it hasn't kicked in yet, but an increasingly important driver into the future is going to be climate change. So I want to draw your attention to those two things, climate change and uh, habitat, uh, habitat um, modification. 
And if you think about what is driving habitat modification, 80% of that problem lies with agriculture and food. So the two major systems that we need to get right if we are going to bend this curve is to transition our energy system to renewable energy and to transition our food system into one which is more efficient, more effective, and less harmful on, on our ecosystems. And to just uh, you know, give you a sense of our impacts on land, I'm going to just take a quick walk through. Uh, just go back, one back, please. There we go. Quick walk through the uh, impacts that humanity have had on the surface of the, of the planet over the last uh, 10,000 years, this period of stability. So if we start in about 8,000 years, this is where humanity is starting to settle down. The last ice age is starting to disappear. Humans are settling down. First agriculture is appearing, and you start seeing sort of wisps of impact in the in Mesopotamia area and uh, a little bit in South America. If we go on to about a thousand years, we're starting to see rapid uh, modification happening in India and uh, across uh, Europe. Going on again to 200 years, again, a lot of modification happening in Europe and uh, in Asia, slightly moving into China. Uh, moving on to the last slides, uh, all the way up now, from 60 years before present, uh, last, last click if you don't mind, to where we are now, we're seeing a modification spreading into Africa, into South America, and across uh, North America. To the place where we are now, where we've modified about 50% of, or about half of the Earth's surface, and 80% of that, uh, that modification has happened due to agriculture. So if we think of a future where we need to double food uh, production, where we need to produce more food in the next 30 years than we've produced in the last 8,000 years, we need to think very carefully about how we plan our agricultural systems, how we make them more efficient, how we improve yields so we do not expand into new areas, but also tackle things like food waste, and also look at diets, and the uh, diets is a huge driver because not all food is equal, and uh, certainly meats have a far higher impact on, on our planet than other forms of food. So diet, food waste, and efficiency uh, in terms of production are things that we're going to have to address from an agricultural point of view. And then, <clears throat> You know, added to this now, we live in, in a time where uh, probably the biggest investment in infrastructure is happening. So we are seeing these developing economies now starting to invest significantly in infrastructure. This infrastructure uh, is, is likely to shape uh, uh, trade routes, it's likely to shape uh, settlements, it's likely to shape uh, whole ecosystems. The impacts of of this planned infrastructure can't be uh, overscored. So we're talking about 60 to $70 trillion investment in infrastructure up to 2030. This one initiative, which you will well recognize here, the Belton Road Initiative, and I know the WWF team will be talking about this over the next couple of days, already a trillion dollar um, commitment from China, 70 countries involved, a massive investment that is likely to reshape uh, these landscapes uh, entirely. If we move on to the next slide, uh, on the positive side, luckily our sophistication and our ability to deal with these impacts has also increased and improved with uh, the, the, in, in, the increase in the scale of the impact. So we now have new tools, more sophisticated tools to deal with land, uh, land use planning and to be able to make more informed decisions around land use planning. And one of these tools is the WWF site tool, which combines development planning information with ecological information and looks at how we can make better decisions. Other tools include the natural capital tool, and I know there are representatives of that group as well here, which allows you to look at trade-offs uh, between decisions. And so this is just an example of looking at the Belton Road Initiative and uh, some of the plans, at least the spatial plans from the Belton Road Initiative and overlaying that on the habitats of threatened species. And you can immediately see where the areas are, where the areas of uh, um, high conflict are, and where we're going to th have to think very carefully about the decisions, the planning, uh, in terms of the development of that infrastructure. 
Then moving on to other uh, 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 new approaches and modern approaches, I think our, our, our thinking around how we finance landscapes and how we uh, direct finance into, the land, into landscapes is fast changing and needs to evolve uh, very quickly. And I know this is a topic that you're going to speak uh, about as well. And this again is an area that WWF is very interested in. We've developed this uh, sustainable finance lab which allows people to think and to incubate ideas about how we uh, structure finance into landscapes. Just moving on, and uh, so one of these ex examples is, uh, is in green bonds. If you just hit the button again. In, in terms of green bonds, if you look at the overall uh, impacts of agriculture, just from a greenhouse gas point of view, agriculture produces about 24% of uh, greenhouse gases. It uses about 70% of water, and as I said, it's the major modifier in terms of uh, impacts of biodiversity. So agriculture is a massive, um, a uh, massive impact in terms of uh, the environment. And yet when you look at the green bonds, uh, agriculture and forestry uh, only occupies 0.9% of the green bond uh, universe. So how can we structure investments uh, in agricultural and into landscapes, into sustainable landscapes in a way that attracts new finance? And the main reason we haven't been able to attract this finance is that we're thinking at two small scales. We're too piecemeal, we've got project by project, and we need to be able to package those projects, be able to package the investments into something which is scalable and which is uh, uh, able to attract uh, the right level of finance. So we just step into the next slide. Um, so typically, just one more. Typically, if we think about landscape, this is the way we think about landscapes. There's an economically productive component of the landscape where we farm, where we do uh, industrial activities, economic activities. And then there's the ecological uh, uh, component of that landscape. So these are protected areas, nature areas that give us water, they give us clean air. They provide us with pollinators, they stabilize our soils, all these good things that these ecological uh, systems do. But typically, we think of them very separately. And if you look at the, from the finance world, one, another one, um, typically we finance them completely separately. So you look at private finance going into the economic uh, component of the landscape, and we look at public finance going into the ecologically productive part of the landscape. And the question is, and the challenge I think for all of us, is how do we package that, the economically productive part of the landscape, along with the ecologically uh, productive part of the landscape, and be able to attract blended finance at scale that goes into, uh, into both sectors, so in a more holistic uh, way of looking at financing sustainable landscapes. And then ensuring that there are flows of finance between the two, between the economically productive and the... Uh, ecologically uh, productive components of the landscape. So I think these are some of the challenges that we need to think of uh, going forward. And finally, just uh, started wrapping up and, and speaking specifically to, to uh, you know, this audience and, and who we are. Um, you know, th there's certainly a changing world order and, and the middle income economies, they represent about 100 uh, countries. 70% uh, of the global population, about 30% of GDP, um, and also the places where most of this biodiversity is lying. So most of the important biodiversity is lying in these middle, econo middle income uh, economies. And we'll see that, you know, clearly there is a change in this order with an increasing growth in the middle uh, income uh, economies, stagnation in the high income economies, and there is a, a shift in power that is happening that it leads to a greater leadership from uh, middle income uh, economies. In terms of global geopolitics, we're also moving from a world where we used to think of the global north funding the global south. So the millennium, eco, the milli, millennium uh, development goals were set around uh, the north funding the south to do things. Uh, and when we work, look at e SDGs now, the Sustainable Development Goals, it's a completely different view. If we look at how Paris is structured, we're talking about universal agendas that require universal responses from everybody, rather than a north-south view. So I think this is a changing world order that we need to embrace, and greater leadership will come from the middle-income uh, economies. 
Then just talking quickly around also the middle class, which is mostly sitting in these uh, middle income economies. We're talking about a shift where most of the growth in the middle class will happen in Asia and in many of these middle income uh, economies. So we're talking about a past where about 60% of middle income consumption pressure came from North America and, uh, and Europe to a future where more than 60%, uh, closer to 70% of that pressure will come from, uh, from Asia. So the middle income consumption will be sitting uh, in, in Asia. So we need to think of how we, how we deal with that. And then uh, just stepping through, you know, sustainable development on what we're trying to do. I, I love this graph, and I encourage you to go onto the uh, Global Footprint Network to have a look, little bit, uh, have a deeper look at, at, at these graphs. But this is a, a graph of human development index uh, on the horizontal axis and ecological footprint on uh, the uh, vertical axis. And clearly, uh, the objective of sustainable development is to get into that magic box down there on the left-hand uh, corner, where you're able to have a high human development index, good social well-being for your people, but live within the boundaries of the planet uh, that, uh, that we need to live within. And typically, um, the middle income economies are sort of sitting there. They're probably the, the countries that are closest to that magic box. But unfortunately, if you, just hit the next animation, if you, if you look at the trajectory of development, what you tend to see is this huge deviation of this path, where you start seeing countries uh, developing, uh, uh, having a far higher ecological footprints for very little uh, human development uh, index gain. So you start seeing this massive increase in their, in their footprint. And this is the typical development trajectory that you see. And, and there's animations of these uh, graphs that you can look at and you can follow the development trajectory of many of these countries. And the question clearly on our mind is, is there an alternative uh, development trajectory? Is there a shortcut that avoids us going through this unnecessary uh, deviation of increasing our impacts on the planet uh, for very little human uh, development uh, benefit? And I think these are some of the models that we, we need to uh, explore. And so, luckily, you know, the one good thing about uh, being a, a fast follower in terms of economic development is that you're able to capitalize on what people have done before you. And, and the, one of the very positives is that we're seeing the time span for technological penetration reducing radically. So where you had electricity taking something like 46 years to reach about 25% penetration in, in, uh, in the market. We're seeing something like the World Wide Web taking seven years for penetration. So technologies are able to penetrate and take off at a far faster rate uh, in, 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 the, in the world that we live in. And we're also seeing this with, um, uh, with uh, renewable energies. We've seen a renewable energy uh, doubling of renewable energy capacity every 5.4 uh, years. Uh, and this is being compared to Moore's law, which was about computing power, where the, the law was that computing power doubled every two years. And uh, we're seeing this sort of uh, exponential growth in technology. And if this exponential growth continues just at this rate, we're likely to be able to move to a completely fossil-free future well before 20, uh, 2050. So just by backing technology, backing innovation, uh, and putting in place the right policies that allow technological innovation to happen within the renewable sector, you're able to create this uh, exponential growth. And I think that's what we need to be thinking, not in linear terms, but in exponential, uh, in, in exponential terms. Those countries that don't join it will be left behind, and I think we need to uh, embrace that, uh, that future. And I'll just end off that the next three years, I think, are, are critical. We can just hit through this slide. Um, there, there are a number of policy opportunities that are, are um, available for us to set a new trajectory. The Convention on Biological Diversity will be resetting its strategic plan. We're looking at the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, uh, having its first uh, review and uh, looking at how it moves forward to, over the last decade. It'll also be resetting 18 of its environmental goals uh, within that framework. 
and then the Paris Agreement will be finalizing the national, de uh, national uh, determined contributions and be starting its work uh, from 2020. So there are major components that if we shape them correctly can set us on the right trajectory over the next three years. So I guess my, my parting message is that the next three years are a critical time in making some decisions that will set us up for the ne next decade and hopefully then take us through the next several decades up to 2050 on a path that then can stabilize uh, our planet for the future. Thank you very much for your attention.